Praise the Lord, guys. Uh, we're going to get started with tonight's Bible study. Uh, we are in uh, week six of um, Back to Basics. Uh, and I'm so excited about um, tonight, uh, about what God has in store for us tonight. So like always, um, I encourage everybody to move up to the front uh, and try to fill up the, you know, the front rows of the church. Um, that way everybody's kind of closer or whatever. So um, feel free to move up. I mean, we have open seats in the front, uh, second, third, fourth row. Back, you guys can move up, all of you guys. Um, and again, we're in week six of Back to Basics. Uh, again, I mean, I think everybody knows what um, what the topic is. Um, is what it what it um what the definition of it is uh, we've had some very 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 good um uh, things that we've talked about that have been so effective you know um, all the people that have been bringing their bible studies uh it's been so effective and and you know again back to basics um is pretty much a, a, the, the topic is about things that we already know or we should know as christians um the fundamental things that we should know. But over time, uh, we need to refresh our memory. We need to understand them, relearn them uh, again, just like we did at first. Um, and actually, like we mentioned before too, there are some things that we actually, uh, we need to keep uh, reminding ourselves of, some things that we just can't forget. And even if we've already learned them once, uh, it's, it's really good and I think it's necessary actually that we teach them every every here and there um, because there's thing, there, there are things that we cannot forget, um, absolutely fundamental. So um, tonight, Brother Edgar is going to bring the word. I believe this is like his third Bible study um, tonight. So I'm excited and um, he's going to um, continue and open up with prayer and, uh, and, and lead it on. So God bless everybody. everybody. Um, welcome to today's um, Friday night Bible study. Um, if you could all rise to your feet and join me in prayer um, today, please. And before we start uh, this Bible study, I would like to ask you guys, um, if you guys could participate, please. Um, I feel like it breaks the ice more, you know, it, it gives people more freedom, you know, to ask questions, you know, to uh, give commentary or just to break the ice, you know, so that it could feel more comfortable. So if you guys could um, participate, I do have some questions for today for you guys. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to pray now. Father Almighty, I thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity and all of us, Lord Jesus, of being here in your house once again, Lord. I am right here asking you, Father, that you may manifest yourself today, Lord. Speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Let your word be that double-edged sword, Lord, penetrating through our hearts, through our thoughts, Father. I ask you, Lord, that your word may rebuke us, correct us, Father, and any and anything, Lord Jesus, that we need correction in, Lord. I ask you that you may take away all distractions, all opposing and negative thoughts, Lord, and let your spirit flow today, Lord. May I only be a speaker for your word, Lord. I don't want none of the words to be mine, Lord, but I want all of them to be yours, Lord. All of this is for your glory, Lord. May all the honor and glory and power be to you, Lord. I ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> um, well, like Gonzalo was saying, this month's uh, Bible study, um, last month's and this month's um, Bible study was back to basics. Um, and we opened up with um, Brother James' Bible study, which was on prayer. Um, then... Brother Robert followed with his Bible study, which was on unity. <clears throat> well, what do you guys, what do you guys think when you guys hear the word repentance? What, what, what do you guys think that repentance means? Robert.
um, like, basically, like, you know, getting on your knees and, like, not repenting necessarily, like, speaking out from your heart. For we know in the Bible that's, that's something that's very deceitful. And, you know, sometimes I feel like it even deceives our own self, let alone others. But repenting from your soul. And then that's where, you know, as Brother Oscar, like, you know, says, you know, that's where, that's where you'll see change in someone. Not on that outside, but on the inside, through the fruits of the Spirit and everything like that, you will see them as, you know, it said, you know, in the Word, you know, you'll see them be born again. They'll be changed, the way how they speak, the way how they talk and everything like that. But repentance comes, like, you know, from deep within your soul, just surrendering and letting go of your old life. Um, I think repentance is obviously, you know, being sorry, but um, with fruits, with actions, you know, actually being sorry through your actions, not through your words. And that's what I think repentance is, not just being sorry, but showing all of your actions and turning away from what you're sorry about. Stop doing like what you were doing and do like what's right. All right. Um, well, with repentance, you know, a lot of people usually associate the feeling of um, remorse. When you feel remorse for um, doing something that you're not supposed to, feeling regret, or even feeling shame. But I think repentance isn't just feeling those things. Repentance goes um, far beyond just feeling those things. Uh, feeling those things is only a start to what repentance truly is. And I don't know if they could put up the, the definition of what repentance is. All right, well, I have the, the definition. Um, um, repentance, what I, uh, I looked it up, you know, um, and in other words, this is what I, what I came up with. Um, repentance is to turn away from sin and to turn to God, living a life devoted to him. Um, two important points, turning away from sin and turning to God. Um, but now that we know what repentance is, how do I know I've repented? Um, that's another question that I have for you guys. How do, how, how do you know, you know, that you've repented, you know, and you're not just feeling remorse or shame every time, you know, that you do something wrong? Jackie? I think you can tell um, when you've truly repented from something, when you don't go back to it. Because when you fully, fully, fully give it up, you have no desire to come back. Maybe there is a desire, but you're strong enough to just hold back from it and understand that God is greater than, than that. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, well, yeah. Um, repentance, it's demonstrated through a radical change. Oh, my bad, bro. My bad. <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, it's crazy because, I mean, I feel like, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm getting ahead. Um, but um, a lot of times we say we're sorry, right? Um, uh, and, and repentance pretty much is an apology, right, to God. Um, you know, like, I'm sorry, God, because of so and so and so. Uh, I've lived in darkness. You know, I've, you know, um, lived in sin, like a sinful life. You know, you're holy. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm never going to do it again. Um, but sometimes um, uh, I feel like the true way that we know we repented and we're sorry is, yeah, by, by not doing it again, obviously. Um, but I feel like sometimes um, we only say we're sorry sometimes, but it's just um, saying sorry. It's not repenting because there's a difference between, you know, saying sorry and actually repenting, you know. You know, it's a difference between, I can say I'm sorry, you know, and, and you know, I guess that. But it's it's just words, you know. It's just like, um, just because I feel bad, you know. I feel bad for what I did. Um, and so sometimes we feel like, um, oh, I repented. You know, I repented from what I did. Um, but 
repentance um, is more than words. Is more than words. Uh, repenting, you don't even have to say you're sorry. I think it's more about action, about action, and evidence. Evidence. Um, you know the, the the ways that you see that somebody truly said sorry or repented is by the evidence that they don't do it again. Um, not just next week, you know, not just within a month, but never, 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 ever go back to it. You know, and sometimes, like I'm saying, we feel like, you know, we say sorry, and it's been a, a week, you know, and it's been, you know, a month, you know, but we go back, you know, and that was just a sorry, you know. Repentance is like, you'd never go back. You cut that, like, completely. I mean, there's there's no turning back, so, um, but, I mean, I guess, you know, you have more to say, so. Amen. Anyone else? Um, well, indeed, um, I think you guys hit all the whole point, the whole Bible study basically there. Um, <laughs> no, but um, the way that you know that your repentance is um, through the way that you live, just like how they were saying, you know, if no longer doing what you used to do, you know, if you were a liar, you know, like you never go back to lying. You don't lie anymore, you know, because if you, just how Gonzalo was saying, you know, like if you're a liar, you know, and and you, you tell God that you're sorry, you know, but tomorrow, you know, like you lie again, that's not truly repenting. That's just saying, telling God that you're sorry, maybe because you just feel like you have an obligation to, you know? So um, I have uh, one more question, one more question for you guys. Um, how and where, where does repentance come from? Does it come from baptism? Does repentance happen in the moment that, you, that we're baptized? Or do we just naturally possess re um, repentance, you know, that we can repent whenever we want? Anyone care to take a guess at it? Anthony? I would say repentance is, it'll, it'll come from the heart. That um, whatever you feel like repenting, it will, like, happen. Like... It's like you have to make the choice either to repent or not. Carmen? Um, I kind of like what Anthony said, that like repentance comes, you know, within your heart. Um, I don't believe that because you're baptized, you're repented. I believe that it is the evidence and evidence that you have repented because in the Bible, you know, it says repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. So it's like you, um, you don't have to be baptized to be repented, but it is the evidence that you have repented. Um, this kind of adds on, it's, it's crazy, but, um, kind of adds on what just, um, Sister Carmen just said, um, it's in Luke chapter 23, verse 39, and it says, um, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you, don't you fear God even when you have sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And um, I just thought of that verse just because of the fact that, like, how Sister Carmen said, you know, before baptism, you know, right there, like, just as those two, Jesus obviously, you know, didn't deserve to be nailed on the cross. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't commit any crime. But those two did. You know, and one mocked, but the other one, you know, right there, he repented, you know, and he said, Lord, you know, like, we deserve to be up here, not you. And he told him right there, he's like, I assure you, you'll be, you'll be in paradise with me once we both die and leave this earth. You know, so as she was saying, you know, like repentance, you know, it's just a matter of like, yes, you know, baptism as well. But repentance is something that's key that even this man without getting baptized, you know, I know that's before all of that came forth. But Jesus assured him that he was going to be with him because right there in that moment leading up to the minutes of his own death, you know, he repented right there.
Amen. Anyone else? Um, amen. I agree with, every, with what everybody said, with what Anthony said. You know, that it can't, it, repentance comes from the heart. And with what Sister Carmen said, uh, that's something that I wanted to point out because I've heard um, many people, you know, they asked him, you know, um, to you, what does repentance mean or when does repentance come? You know, and they say repentance comes, you know, when you get baptized, you know, but no, repentance doesn't come when you get baptized or it doesn't come just because you're baptized, you know. You get baptized because you've repented. Um, just like Brother Robert showed in that um, verse, that man, we see that he didn't even get baptized, you know. But because he repented, Jesus told him, you will be in paradise with me. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I forgot to, to um, read the opening scripture. But if you guys could join me um, in Luke chapter 3, verse, um, starting from verse 8. This is to point, um, to show the point um, of the previous question that I had asked. How do I know I've repented? Um, and we all said that, um, we basically, we agreed that it was through our actions, you know. So it's going to be from verse 8 through 14. <clears throat> and this was when uh, John the Baptist was uh, preaching. Um, starting from verse 8, it says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented. Of your sins and turn to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are descendants of Abraham. He was speaking to the Pharisees right here, so that's why he said that. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to, to severe the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not pr produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked, what should we do? Oh, yeah, all the way up to 14. John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. So we see here... Um, how tax collectors came up to John and they asked him, you know, what should we do, you know? And he told them because John was announcing, you know, the coming of the Messiah. So then the tax collectors came and they told him, you know, what should we do? How do we get prepared for his coming? And he told him, you know, don't charge people more money than what you guys usually charge them, you know, because we know that tax collectors usually charge them more than what it actually was, you know. So um, that's the point to prove, you know, that repentance is shows through act is shown through actions and um now we could turn to acts chapter 3 verse 26 <clears throat> so repentance we know that it doesn't come from baptism, and we naturally don't possess it. Repentance comes from God. God is the only one that can bring repentance to us. Through his word is how we get repented. His, his word touching our hearts, that is how um, our hearts turn, you know. If we see in the day of Pentecost, the Jews, you know, the Jews didn't go up to Peter and told him, oh, we want to be baptized, you know, because we know that we've sinned. No, you know, it was through the message that Peter gave them that they repented, that they asked him, you know, what should we do then? So um, Acts chapter 3, verse 26, it says, When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. So there we can see, you know, that it is God, the one that brings repentance to our lives. And now knowing all these things, you know, um, I want to I wanna talk about... Um, a couple men of the Bible um, in which we see repentance and in which we don't see repentance as well. Um, and one of them is David. Um, we know that David, you know, was a man after God's own heart, you know. We know that David was is known as the greatest king of Israel, you know. But we also know that David sinned. We know that um, one day David didn't go out to battle with his army when he should have. And on, and on that day, 
he put his guard down and we know that he went out and he saw a, a young, the Bible says a young beautiful woman, you know, taking a bath and he lusted over her and he went to go ask, you know, who is that woman, you know, and they came back and told him that it was Bathsheba and that she was married, but David, David didn't care, you know, his eyes had already lusted, he had already fallen into sin, so he slept with her, you know, and we know the story that um, she became pregnant, she became pregnant, and um, David tried bringing back um, her, her husband, you know, to make it seem, because her husband was in war, and he wanted to make it seem like it had been her husband, you know, that slept with her, so it was his child. I apologize for that. I'm having a lot of bit of um, heartburn. I don't know why it always happens. <clears throat> but um, we know that God knows all things, you know. And even though he tried to hide his sin, you know, we know that God sees and God knows all things, you know. And the Bible says, you know, that what we try to hide, you know, now will sooner or later, you know, come out into the light. And indeed, you know, God sent a prophet to David, you know. And he confronted him about his sin. Um, so we could turn to 2 Samuel um, chapter 12 now. Anybody like to read it? Question mark? Rosa? Go ahead. It's going to be from verse 1 all the way up until 14. From 1, from one to verse 14. Okay. <clears throat> Should I read it on there? Okay. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had brought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So start. Oh, okay, okay. I couldn't find it. Okay. One day, a guest arrived at home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and pre prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing serves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man, the Lord of God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave, I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdom, kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have been, I, w I would have given you much, much more. Why, why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uri Uriah the hit a tie with the sword of the 
Ammonites and stole stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says, because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of Israel, of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. 14.2 So I have um, two points as to um, um, like what, how, how, how um, it is that we can be repented, you know, and one of those points is humbleness. Um, we see that um, David was confronted by um, the prophet, and he tells him, you know, that man is you, you know. I don't know about you guys, you know, but um, if, I don't know, if I was in sin, you know, and, and the man of God, you know, came and told me, you know, like, you're in sin, you know, like, God knows that you're in sin, you know. I don't, I don't know about you guys, you know, but I feel like maybe I would try to deny it, you know, or, or, or justify myself, you know, because as humans, that's something that we tend to do, you know, but we see in verse 13, you know, David's humbleness, you know, it says, then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And I believe that um, the reason why David was, um, why God called David a man after his own heart wasn't because of the way that he danced, you know, or the way that he reigned, you know. I believe that it's because of his humbleness, you know, that he had to be able to confess, you know, that he sinned, you know. Um, before, when a prophet would come, you know, to a king and tell them, you know, you know what, hey, you're sinning, you know, and, and God doesn't improve of that, they would usually um, either they would kill the prophet or they would have him um, imprisoned, you know, and um, I'm going to read a story really quick to show that. Um, it's in Matthew. You guys don't have to go there. Matthew um, chapter 14. When um, Herod and Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about Jesus, he said to his advisors, This must be John the Baptist, raised from the dead. This is why he can do such miracles. For Her Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife, Herodias, the former wife of to Herod's brother Philip. John had been telling, telling <clears throat> Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry her. Why? Because she was um, his own brother's wife. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. But uh, um, we all know that he did um, imprison him and he ended up killing him. He ended up beheading him. Um, but we see, you know, that, that David had the chance, you know, he, he could have either chosen, you know, to deny and, um, like I said, justify himself, you know, like Adam. We see that when um, God confronted Adam, you know, um, he justified himself, you know, and he blamed his wife, you know, for the sin that he had committed, you know. But we see the difference, big, big difference between David and Adam, you know. David confessed his sin, you know, and that, and that is why God forgave him in that instant because God had, I mean, um, David had that humbleness, you know, and that's something that doesn't come in, in, in us humans, you know. Humbleness isn't something that we um, naturally possess, you know. So uh, I don't know if there's anything anybody would like to say. Jackie? Okay, so um, I think this is a really, really, really good point you're getting to because um, I think it's one of those things that whenever we do something wrong it's always something that we don't want anybody else to see you know and so um sometimes you know when when people do catch us in the act like i don't know if like your parents have ever caught you in the act of doing something or or maybe your best friends or maybe your girlfriend or your boyfriend you know doing something that you know you're not supposed to do 
it's like you kind of run away from it. Nobody wants to like accept the fact that what they did was wrong. They know it was wrong, they already know that, but to have somebody like put it in your face, it's just like, for what? And so I think with um, that type of mentality, it's just like um, the reason that David was able to just be forgiven by God, because if we're being honest, nowadays, you know, it's like anybody can be forgiven by God, but it's the act that gets you there. You have to be honest with your words and everything. So I think um, it, it's interesting because Bible, I mean, David was the only person in the Bible that was referred to as having a heart after, like a heart after God's own. So I think it's really just important to say, you know, and especially with this kind of religion that we sometimes fall into, that we have to fit this like perfect mold and everything we have to do has to be perfect and you can't mess up and, and there's just no room for mistakes, you know, but um, that isn't true at all. You know, it's like God leaves um, some room for mistakes. That's why we, we are able to be forgiven. That's why he went to the cross because he knew that there was going to be mistakes that we commit. You know, but with this whole idea of repentance, it's you have to be aware of those mistakes and not be willing to run back to them because you get caught up in the cycle over and over and over again. And, and that's the exact cycle that Jesus died on the cross for to break. So we wouldn't be stuck in that. So um, I think it's just important to mention that, you know, the only reason why David was able to get back up on his feet, you know, in the position that he was in was because he was able to get on his knees. So, um, I don't know, it's really, really important that you say that. So, um, that's all I have to say. Would anyone else like to add anything? Yeah, or just anything in general. Well, yeah, obviously connect to this. No? No one else? No, Gonzalo? Yeah, amen. Um... So I feel like uh, another point that I mean I, I know that um, we we uh, we know about repentance is that um, repentance is a progress or a process, uh, right? Repentance is a process. Um, you know I know that um, we have to turn around. You know we have to turn around and and, um, and look back no longer. Um, but it's still a process. You know uh, we're not perfect. You know obviously. Um, but I feel like um, the, the, the step, number one step to find repentance is confession, you know, confessing that you're wrong. Um, I mean, like God will not forgive you if you don't come and say, you know what, it was me. Yeah, I did this. Um, it was me. You know, I killed Uriah. Uh, you know, I slept with his wife. You know, he, like David, he uh, acknowledged it and confessed it. So I feel like um, the first first thing that we have to do um, to be forgiven and to find repentance is um, is acknowledge that we we did it. You know, it was our fault. I mean, um, you know, we, we sinned. Um, and and here's some scriptures. Um, you don't have to look them up. I'm just gonna see. I'm just gonna um, write or um, quote them. Um, Proverbs 28:13 um, says this: He who conceals his transgressions, like hides it. If you hide your sin. If you cover it, if you bury it, and you, you know, pretend like it didn't happen, um, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses it, confesses it, and forsakes it, you know, first, you know, admit you did it, you know, that was your, it was your fault, confess it, and then walk away from it. Um, and forsakes them will find compassion. So that's the key, you know, to finding, you know, God's forgiveness. Um, uh, uh, but where am I at? Um, 1 John um, 1, uh, verse uh, 8 and 9. So look at, again, nobody's perfect. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Everybody's sin. Everybody. Everybody. We all, we all have to come to a point where we say, you know what, I messed up. I'm not perfect. I did I did this, and it's on me. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meaning, we can flip this around, saying, you know, if we don't confess our sins, then he will not forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
But if we confess them, if we are open about it with God and say, God, I did this, you know, it was me, um, then God, we, we unlock um, God's forgiveness. And then we can be forgiven and, and, and find and step into repentance. And last, um, Hebrews um, 4.16 um, says this, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace, grace to help uh, in time of need. So, you know, like God's going to forgive you, you know. God is has has grace, you know, his His language is grace. The throne room is grace. He just wants you to come and tell him, you know, what happened. And and if we confess that, we unlock that um, that forgiveness and then truly that's that's the number one um step to be to find repentance by humbling yourself which meaning which is which means to acknowledge you know that you you did something wrong you know and then let it out and confess it to god amen amen um yeah um like what jackie was saying um many times you know uh, we fall in, in, into um, this religion, you know, where we think and we feel like we have to be perfect for everyone, you know, but um, that's where humbleness kicks in, you know, because David was king, you know, and I'm sure he didn't want anybody to find out, you know, I'm sure that um, he, it was, he was leading a whole nation, you know, and that was going to mess up his reputation, you know, so in, in his head, you know, I'm sure that that's why he did what he did, you know, because he didn't want anybody to see him differently, you know. But the thing is, you know, that when, when the prophet confronted him, you know, he realized, you know, God knows, you know, and there's no point in me hiding my sin anymore, you know. So, um, yeah, that's, um, we must have humbleness in order to be able to repent. Um, something else that we must have um, in order to be able to repent is love for God. Um, when we repent, we know um, that we turn away from what we were doing, our sin, and we turn to God, you know. And when you do that, you put God above whatever it is that you were doing, you know, whether it might be lying, whether it might be stealing, you know. You're putting God above that. And the only way that you can do that is if you love God more than what you love um, your sin. <clears throat> We see that um, David didn't hesitate, you know. David loved God more than what he loved women, you know, because um, after this, you know, um, we don't see David um, continue on doing what he was, what he did, you know. We don't see him that he went on, you know, and he kept on sleeping with other men's wives, you know. Yeah, he did have a lot of wives, you know, but after this, he didn't go on and sleep. He didn't sleep anymore with other men's wives you know he turned from that you know but um i would like to speak about somebody that that loved his sin more um than than god um and for that if we could turn to first kings um chapter 11 um from verse 1 and on and that man is solomon <clears throat> Solomon, you know, the, the great, wise Solomon, you know, who um, when God asked him, you know, I'll give you anything, he asked God, you know, give me wisdom so that I may be able to lead your nation. The Solomon, you know, that, that wrote um, almost, you know, a, a good portion, you know, of the book of Proverbs, you know, that Solomon, you know, um, ended up loving his sin more than what he loved God. <clears throat> so in First Kings chapter 11 um, from verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, uh, we know that Fa the Pharaoh was the king of Egypt. You know, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, S -S Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyways 
He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord, his God, and his father David had been. Solomon worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine of Chemosh, Shemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable god of Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's commands. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and dis disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. Amen. Up to there. Um, so we see the difference, you know. Um, it's crazy just in between the father and the son, you know. Um, we see the big difference, you know, that David was able, you know, to, to give up his love for women, you know. But Solomon wasn't able to. He loved he loved women so much, you know, that it led him astray, you know. And the thing is that God warned him, you know. And I remember when I read this, um, back when I started coming to church, it, it made me sad, you know, because I was like, man, you know, Solomon started out so good, you know. Um, God had asked him, you know, ask me for anything and I will give it to you, you know. And Solomon asked him for wisdom. You know, and we hadn't seen that before, you know. Solomon had started out so good, you know, and, and we know, you know, that he wrote the book of Proverbs, you know. And, and when I read that and I was like, man, you know, he really did, you know, mess up at the end, you know. And it's not about who starts the race, but it's how you finish it, you know. So, yeah, I was, I was really bummed out when I read that, you know. And I think that we could apply that to us now, you know. Um, many times, you know. God tells us, you know, that, that something in specific isn't good for us, you know, whether it might be, you know, dating somebody, you know, from the world, um, whether it might be hanging out with certain people, you know, who you know you're not supposed to, whether it might be doing whatever, you know, watching things that you're not supposed to. But we love that so much, you know, we put that above God, you know, that it leads us astray, you know, just like it did to Solomon, you know, so we can't repent if we don't love God more than what than um, our sin. Um, I don't know if anybody would like to add anything. Carmen? Um, as you were reading um, the passage, um, I stopped at the, or like what kind of spoke to me was the Lord was very angry with Solomon and like in our minds, like how you were saying, it's like, yeah, you know, um, why wouldn't he be? But like, let's apply that to us. You know, our like um, Solomon might have been giving his whole time and his whole devotion and his whole worship to women, but what are we doing that's like the same with time? You know, what are we giving our time to? You know, what gods are, um, what idols are we putting before our God? You know, like TV or TikTok or Instagram or our relationship with our significant other it's like for me that that's how it personally spoke to me you know it's like yes Solomon was had 700 wives and what else like 300 I don't know what that is but yeah yeah like he had that but it in our minds you know we judge and we're just like dang like you know shake my head or something but it's <laughs> it's like with us um we we have fallen into that too might have not been with women but with the time that we're giving um these earthly things too, you know? But yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Amen. Uh, would anyone else like to add anything? No? 
Well, yeah, um, it's true. Um, like everything, you know, we always have to apply the word of God um, into our lives, you know. So, yeah, you know, just, just ask yourselves, you know, what is it, you know, that I'm putting or what is it that I love more than God, you know, today? What is it that you're spending more time on, you know? What is it that you're devoting more um, than what you're devoting to God, you know? Why is it, you know, that we aren't the same than what we used to be, you know? What is it that has led us astray, you know? Ask yourself um, that question. And um, I have um, two scriptures um, for this. Um, one of them is in Luke 14, 26. Yeah, 14, um, 26. It says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Um, I mean, it says it clear, you know, it doesn't literally mean, you know, oh, you know what, like hate your mom, hate your dad, hate your brother, hate your sister, hate your wife. No, it just means, you know, that when in, when on a scale, you know, you have to love God more than what you love those things. Even your, even your own mother and father, you know, and um, one more verse, John 14, verse 15. That one says, if you love me, obey my commands, you know, so we have to love God more than what we love anything else in this world. Um, and if nobody has anything else to add, oh, Michelle. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's really true, you know, that um, in order to, like, be able to overcome, you know, like, what you're sitting and be able to be um, give that true repentance is to be able to love God. But sometimes, you know, sometimes as humans, we accept defeat by accepting the fact that, oh, the sin is way stronger than we are. And there's something that Sister Ceci always tells me. She's like, remember the authority that God has given you. You know, there's this um, verse in um, Romans 6.1. It says, sin's power is broken. It says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? So it's just like when Jesus died on that cross, you know, he shed that blood, you know, to be able to forgive us from our sins. And those sins that we still haven't been repented from doesn't have any power over us. But sometimes we accept that defeat when it shouldn't be like that. But when you love God, when you understand what he did on that cross for you, you understand that not even sin, not even death, nothing, not even hell, not even demons could separate you from the love of God. And nothing could separate you from your love towards him, not even that sin. And with true repentance, you know, you have to be able to love God and accept the fact that, yes, you're going to fail, but you have to get back up all those times that you fail. Because if you accept defeat, God can't help you there. He's a winner, you know. He's a fighter. He's the almighty, and he, like, deals with fighters, you know, which is us. But if we accept defeat, you know, he can't work with us. And the devil, you know, already had got his full hold with us. And we have to be able to forgive ourselves mainly as well. Because if we can't forgive ourselves for what we did, how can God forgive us? Because sometimes, you know, like, yes, we're our true biggest enemies. And sometimes where the devil could hold us down from is from ourselves forgiving ourselves. Because, yeah, sometimes we feel bad. You know, we should feel bad that we felt God, but we shouldn't stay there. We should turn that feeling, you know, into motivation to be able to do right next time and to get back up stronger. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else? And yeah, that's something that um, hits us hard, you know, um, when we fail God, condemnation, you know, the, the devil tries uh, to condemn us, you know, um, for what we've done, you know, but we have to be sure, you know, that what God, what Christ did, you know, on that cross is enough, you know, to pay and to set us free from those um, sins that we've committed. So, um, yeah, um, now gonna touch or I'm gonna talk about um, a nation you know that 
is the opposite, you know, of what repentance is, you know. Um, but I would like to ask you guys, um, do you guys think, you know, that if somebody claims that they have repented, can they go back to do um, what they used to do? Do you guys think that if you say or, you know, that you've repented, can you go back to do, you know, the, the thing that you used to do? So for this question, I would personally say no, because the way I, I see repentance is like a commitment, right? So like, say you are committed to a person, you know, once you kind of give your word in, it's like you don't go back to an ex, you don't go looking for anybody else, right? It's like you're committed to that one person. And so same thing with repentance. It's like when you give your word to God, you know that you're gonna turn away and you truly mean it and you're so serious with God, it's like a conviction a conviction that God puts within you because it's like even when you think about turning back to whatever it was you know it's going to be in your mind like no but you said this to God you know and it's the same thing it's like that's why it's literally just a relationship that you have with God because if you're keeping up with that relationship just like with anybody else with talking and texting you know if you're praying to God if you're reading the word of God you're always going to remember that commitment you made exactly how it is with any person so i i apply that to this repentance you know it's like it's not something that you just be like yeah like um i'm sorry god and then you keep on living your life and it's just you you go back to it you know there's times where you could be so serious you know about a repentance and you're like i'm so sorry god like i'm willing to give you my life in your heart and you do this total surrender you know but it's like when you get up from that prayer, you know, and, and as the days go by, that feeling um, is less and less, less stronger than what it first was. And that's because you're not keeping up with the things of God. You're not, you know, praying. You know, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a continual thing that you remind yourself every single day so you don't fall back into that. So um, personally, I would say no. A person who has truly repented about something cannot go all the way back in because it's, it's something that sticks with you. That's how it should be. No, no one else? No. Um, well, I'm going to talk about Israel. Um, I think Israel is the perfect example, you know, of um, somebody, you know, some, we could, I know we know that it's a nation, you know, but we could put it now, you know, as somebody, somebody that didn't repent. Um, and if you could all join me in the book of Judges, um, chapter 2, um, starting from verse 10. a little bit, you know, I'm going to jump from here to another place, but just try to stick with me. Um, chapter 2 of Judges, um, verse 10 says, after that generation died and another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel, the Israelites did in the Lord's sight and the Israelites did evil, my bad, in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of, the, of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel. So he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. The Lord, Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. We see the mercy of God there. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves by worshiping other gods. How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. 
Whenever the Lord raised a judge over Israel, he was with the judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt waves, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel. He said, Because these people have violated my covenant, which I made with their ancestors and have ignored my commands, I will no longer drive out the nations that Joshua left unconquered when he died. I did this to test Israel to see whether or not they would follow the ways of the Lord as their ancestors did. That is why the Lord left those nations in place. He did not, he did not quickly drive them out or allow Joshua to conquer them. And um, if we could jump uh, in the same book, Judges, but chapter three, verse seven now. <clears throat> And um, verse 7 says, Once again, the Lord, I mean, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God, and they served the images of Baal and the Ash, Asherah poles. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King um, Kushan Rishathaim uh, of Aram. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> And the Israelites served that guy for eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. Again, Lord, the, the God, God's mercy. His name was uh, Othoniel, Othoniel, whatever, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. <laughs> the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. Then he went to the war against the king of Aram, and the Lord gave um, Othoniel victory over him. So there was peace in the land of 40, for 40 years. Then Othoniel, son of Kenaz, died. And then we go to verse 12. Let's read what it says. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord God gave King Eglon to, of Moab control over Israel of their evil and i mean i think we get it you know israel every after you know um uh god sent a judge you know to rescue them and that person passed on you know or after they were delivered they kept on doing the same thing again and again and again you know and if we keep on reading you know even up until the book of kings you know until the end of the book of kings and chronicles we see that israel just didn't understand they didn't get the gist of it you know and they kept on going back and worshiping other gods you know so that to answer you know the question that i had asked you know can somebody you know who says that they have repented you know because when it says that they cried out you know they obviously you know they repented you know supposedly quote unquote you know they would tell god i'm sorry for what i've done you know i understand that i'm in this position you know because of what i've done now rescue me lord but they didn't mean it, you know. All they wanted was to just get out of the that of the oppression, you know. And their actions show that, you know. They just kept on going and doing the same thing over and over again, <laughs> you know. So many times, you know, we can say that we've repented, you know. But if our actions say otherwise, then we really haven't repented, you know. It's like that one saying that they say, you know, actions speak louder than words. Um, you know, it's totally applicable to this. You know, if your actions don't, if your words aren't followed with actions, then you haven't repented. I'm sorry, but you, you don't know what repentance is, you know. <laughs> and um, is there anything that anyone would like to add? Brother James, uh, Brother Gonzalo. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, at the end. Brother Oscar. At the end, <laughs> Gonzalo or David. Huh? Yeah, I'm about to finish. Okay. Um, praise the Lord, everybody. Um, like everything I'm receiving, and like the only thing that keeps being like embedded in my head the entire time we're speaking about repentance, it's just 
one word and it's humility. Like we touched it already, but that's why I was waiting to the end to like wrap it up. But um, humility, I feel like that's the root of repentance. You know, um, my favorite verse in the Bible, James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God, you know, um, resist the devil and he will flee, you know. And then after what follows is come close to God and draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And it says, wash your hands, you sinners, you know. Instead of um, laughing, let there be grief and, and sorrow. That's repentance. He's speaking about repentance. You know, he says, but the first step is submitting yourself. Humility. And then verse 10, you know, when you humble yourself, he will exalt you in honor. You know, so, and you, the, to go back to what we are speaking about um, earlier as well, about um, what it, like, where does it come from? I believe it comes from, you know, separation from God. Repentance, I feel like it's, it, it's like it manifests when you are not, you know, close to the Lord. I feel like when you're in sin, you know, it gives you the opportunity to know repentance. You know, I feel like that's very necessary, you know, and that's just it right there, you know. Um, I feel like it comes from knowing what sin is. Because how, like, I see, like, there's, like, someone who's sick, they don't know what it is, you know. No, someone who's been healed, you can't be healed if you've never been sick, you know. You can't be healed if you've never been sick, so you can't repent if you've never sinned. So I feel like that's where it comes from. It's from sin, you know. Sin, the opposite of that is repentance, just like what we were saying earlier, you know. But I feel like the, the key to all of this is just humility. And I mean, I don't mean being like, oh, yeah, I surrender my life. I this and that, like, not that kind of humility. It's a humility that I feel like no one can explain. There's no words to explain that humility that comes with repentance. You know, everything's beautiful, everything everyone's saying, it makes a lot of sense, but it's like the surface of what it really is. You, not, you have to experience it, and you have to. It's, you, it's unexplainable, you know? So humility, you know, seek humility and that will be, you know, it, it comes with it, you know, I feel like. But humility is the root to it all, to acknowledge that you're wrong, to acknowledge that you need a savior, that you've been living in sin, you know, and that gives it conviction to turn away. So, yeah. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Um, I remember before I came um, to the path, um, they asked me, you know, um, who's this friend? They asked me, um, you know, do you go to church? You know, and I was like, no, you know, like, I don't need to go to church, you know, and if it were up to me, you know, because um, I think I had like around seven years that I hadn't gone to church. Um, I was like, um, I told her, you know, like, no, you know, like, I don't need to go to church, you know, like, why do I need to go to church, you know, and then I, I, I told her, you know, I was like, and if it were up to me, you know, I wouldn't go to church for another seven years, you know, and, and that's pride know because in that moment I was like I don't need to go to church you know like what for you know like I already have everything that I need you know well in my mind you know but like I said you know repentance came from God you know God is the one that brought repentance to me you know it was through his message through his word you know that repentance came to me you know and obviously you know like we touched you know humbleness you know had I had to have humbleness you know to acknowledge you know that I was a sinner, you know, and uh, my ways, you know, were, weren't pleasing to God, you know. So, yeah, humbleness is something very, very, very important, you know, in order to be able to repent. But um, um, going back to the opening verse, um, Luke chapter 3, you guys don't have to open it, but um, Luke chapter 3, um, verse 8. Oh, yeah. Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. You know, Israel didn't prove with their actions, you know, that they had repented, you know, like they had said, you know. Um, and no, you know, like we can't continue sinning like the verse that Michelle said. I was, I was going to touch it, you know, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin 
how can we continue to live in it? So no, and indeed, we, we can't continue to live in sin if we claim to have repented, you know? So I ask you all, don't be like Israel. Don't, don't keep on just saying sorry, you know? And every time that you fail, don't just say that you're sorry, you know, but just continue living the same way that, um, that you did, you know, doing the same things over and over again. Like Jackie said, living, living in that cycle, you know, get out of it, you know, actually mean what you say, you know, when you ask for forgiveness, move out of it. And I, 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 not me, you know, but God promises, you know, that if you mean and you actually repent with all of your heart, God will help you not fall into that sin anymore. So, um, <laughs> um, just to finish off, if we could all join me in Psalms um, chapter 51. And here we're going to see both of the um, things that I, the, both of the points that I had touched, both humbleness and the love of the love for God. And this, this Psalms, you know, if you guys don't know, this Psalms is the Psalms that David had um, wrote when, you know, Nathan confronted him for his sin. You know, this basically is the Psalms of repentance, you know. Um, um, Psalms chapter 51, um, verse 1, Roger. Okay. And it says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize, here, here's humbleness. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb. Te Sorry. Teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep... Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. And here is, here is uh, point number two, love for God. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because all that David wanted to do, like that psalm said, you know, I desire to be in, in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David wanted to be with God every day. That is why he told him, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me because he loved God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to the rebel, rebe rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice, that you, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. I guess we can stop right there. And um, there's um, this thing that a uh, pastor says. You know, that he's been saying lately, um, God has been dealing with humans for thousands and thousands of years now, you know. And there is nothing that you could have done that will scare God, you know. No sin, you know, that will be, that God will be like, look, that God will have, you know, look at you and be like, oh, no, you know, like, you, you committed that sin, you know, like, I can't forgive you, you know. There is nothing, you know that you could have done that will have God look at you, you know. God has seen, you know, the worst of the worst of sins, you know, and, and all of uh, human history, you know. But God is willing to forget, forgive everything, you know. So if there's something, you know, that, that you need to repent of, you know, let our prayer be today, you know. God, bring me, you know, true repentance, 
you know, get, give to me, you know, true repentance, Lord. Let me have the humbleness and, and the love for you, you know, so that I may, ha I may have and get to know what true repentance is, Lord, so that I may not go back to what I used to do, Lord. There's this one song, you know, that, <clears throat> that I really like, you know, um, I don't know if you guys know uh, Montel Fish. Um, it's called Repentance, you know, and, and it starts off by saying, cry out for repentance cry out you know cry out like you're crying out you know and it's basically saying you know ask God for repentance you know cry out like you've never cried out you know so let our prayer tonight you know seek for that true repentance you know that comes from the heart not just from the lips you know the Bible says you know they they praise me with their lips but their hearts are far from me you know so don't let that be don't let that be us today don't let us be Israel but be like David who truly repented, you know, and, and, and loved God. Um, so that is my message um, for you guys, and I hope that this message touched somebody. Um, and, yeah, um, I don't know. Who, okay, Gonzalo. Yeah, man, um, I, really, I really like this, um, the perspective that Brother uh, Edgar um, made us see repentance through. Uh, because, I mean, yeah, we've heard repentance, you know, we've heard what it's about or whatever. Uh, but the way that it was brought tonight, um, it made me, you know, see repentance in a different um, lens, I guess. And um, if you notice, you know, uh, um, through this whole Bible study, uh, there were a lot of idols, you know, that were mentioned. A bunch of idols. Um, there were, you know, King Solomon's idols. Um, there were um, Israel's idols. A bunch of, you know, idolatry, idolatry. And the way that God knew somebody repented was when they took the idols down. When they took the idols down. And so um, I feel like, yeah, definitely, you know, repentance is fundamental. I mean, everywhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, when, when Jesus would call somebody, he would say, um, follow me, you know, leave everything. Follow me, you know, pick up your cross. Um, and he repeated that so many times, you know. We see that in the parable, or not the parable, when the, the rich man, the, the, the young man, you know, he, um, he came to Jesus and Jesus told him, like, I need you to know the fundamental thing about this. Uh, you need to leave everything, you know, leave, it, leave, the, leave the, the, the idolatry you have for money, you know. It's the same concept, you know, same concept. It's idolatry. Um, and there's a scripture where he says, you know, um, he who has put his hand on the plow, he who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. You know, if you if you start something and you're going to look back, uh, you're not worthy, like, to follow me, you know? So it was something that he mentioned so many times. But it's the same concept, you know. Um, to leave something behind uh, means to leave your idols behind. And so uh, in the Old Testament, there are physical idols. I mean, you know, literally, you know. And there was, a, there was, you know, Baal, the idols of Baal. And there was uh, another one that was mentioned. Um, I think it's pronounced Asherim. That was the other one that was, that was mentioned a lot. But here's a guy, right, that, that does repent in the Old Testament, you know. And it's in um, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 1 and on. And it caught my attention, you know, because uh, it was idols, you know. And he was an idolater, but he turned away. Like, it's, it's possible, you know, but he had to do something, like, you know, like Brother Edgar was saying. Uh, verse verse 1 and on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you guys remember, Brother James spoke about him a while ago. Um, so I, that's what clicked into my head, you know. That's what I want to look it up. Uh, Second Chronicles 33, 1 and on. 1 to 14, actually. Or, um, sorry, 16. 1 to 16. Amen. So look at this. Uh, Manasseh, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Okay, another king, just like Solomon and like David. Um, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. So a bunch of, you know, time. He did what was evil. Again, like he followed the cycle that all these kings had, you know. Like it was just a cycle, you know, like building altars, you know, worshiping other gods, you know, all that stuff. Following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. Same thing. He rebuilt the pagan shrines that his father hezekiah he was somebody good had broken down so his father before him just like david broke down everything you know 
and his son, you know, continued like, you know, the opposite. Same thing here. This guy, he rebuilt the pagan shrines his father, Hezekiah, had broken down, and he constructed altars for the images of Baal. This guy, Baal, was, you know, was a, was a big, you know, God, you know? wonder what it was, you know, or wonder what it means today. Maybe money, you know? Or maybe, like, relationships, or, you know, maybe, like, you know? It was somebody big. And he set up a share of poles, um, like altars, too. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. Not God. He built, yeah, like, maybe like, you know, today it might mean like, you know, oh, the universe, you know, um, like tells tells me this or whatever. Like, you know, people do that, you know, like, oh, the universe, you know, and all that stuff. Um, he built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Like inside the temple of God, he built pagan altars. And the place where the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. Like he, he was like, I mean, probably even worse than Solomon. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both country yards of the Lord's temple. Huh? Courtyard, sorry. Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of Ben Hinnom. He practiced sorcery, divination, and I think it's witchcraft. Yeah, witchcraft. And he consulted with mediums and psychics, like, you know, fortune tellers or whatever. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even took a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple. The very place where God had told David and his son Solomon, my name will be honored forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. If the Israelites will be careful to obey my commandments, that's what he said. In all the laws, decrees, and regulations given through Moses, I will not send them into exile from this land that I have set aside for your ancestors. So he did all these crazy things. Look at this. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do even more evil things than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. So they're worse. He was worse, worse, worse. Uh, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they ignored all his warnings. So the Lord sent the commanders of the Assyrian armies, and they took Manasseh prisoner. So he was captive now by a foreign um, you know, army. And they put a ring through his nose, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God, the big G now, of his ancestors. Pause. Or you know what, keep going. Of his ancestors. And when he prayed, so now he's talking to God about it maybe, the Lord listened to him. The Lord listened to him and was moved by his requests. So the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. And look at what he does. After this, Manasseh rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David from the west of Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley of the Fish Gate and continuing the hill of Ophel, he built the very uh, he built the wall very high and he stationed his military officers in all the for, in all of the fortified towns of Judah. And Manasseh also removed the foreign gods, and the idol from the Lord's temple. He tore down all the altars he had built on the hill where the temple, of, when the temple stood and all the altars that were in Jerusalem, and he dumped them outside the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thanksgiving offerings on it, and he also encouraged the people of Judah to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. You see that? This guy, I mean, he was just like the other ones, you know, just like them, you know, with idols, with all those things, even worse. But he humbled himself, you know. And so, again, like, I feel like the way that, you know, you made me see repentance today is, you know, I can't say that I repented if my idols are still standing. You know, I can't say that I repented and, you know, and I'm, you know, repented or whatever if there's still idols, if they're still there. I need to break them. I need to take them down and rebuild God's position in my heart. 
and worship only God. Because if I'm still worshiping idols and God's not the one in my heart completely, then I haven't repented. And I can, this guy was king, you know. This guy was king, you know. Yeah, you can be somebody great, you know. It can be all that, you know. But God wants your heart. God wants your heart. It's always been about the heart. Always, 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 always. But, you know, the way that, you know, applies to us now, you know, is, is what, what are we worshiping, you know? Is it a person, you know? Is it TV, like somebody said? Is it, you know, those are idols. Those are idols that, you know, we can't say we repented unless we, we tear them down, you know? And, I mean, now, I mean, it can apply. It doesn't have to be Baal. You know, it's not necessarily like a, an idol that we just bow down to in a room or something like, but it's might, might be money, you know, that you that you uh, worship, that you um, you know that you want. It might be a person, you know. It might be Disney Plus, you know. Yeah, it is, you know. It might be YouTube, you know. All this stuff, I mean, and and God says like, you know, I I just want your heart. So, but I see that you know. God, he knows, you know, all things, right? And I feel like everybody has to go through what Manasa went through for us to find repentance, I guess. You know, God will break you and God will send the, the other people and then he's going to let you go into captivity and let you feel broken and let you feel alone and let you feel like you don't have anything. And that's where he's going to be like, where are your idols? You know, like, yeah. Where are your idols? Where's Baal? You know, where are the, the universe people or whatever? Nobody's going to be there. Nobody, nobody, because only God can do that. Only God, God can set you free from depression, from suicide. Only God. Not Disney Plus. Disney Plus is not going to be there. YouTube's not going to be that TikToker you always watch or whatever. He's not going to come down and say, oh, you know what, here, you know, let me heal you. you know, let me heal your broken heart, you know? WandaVision's not going to come in. Never mind. All right. <laughs> I know, I'm getting too close, right? Okay, let me step out. <laughs> you know, but we all, <laughs> we all go through that. And, and God does it intentionally because he, he shows us like, hey, the only one that can deliver you is me. And, and that's how we, we break those idols because we find out it clicks, you know. Maybe we weren't, we weren't you know, um, we weren't, you know, we didn't acknowledge that. But through that process that we go through, through that, you know, isolation, through that depression or whatever, we finally see that the only one who can do something is God because he's the only true God. And so that leads to repentance and saying, like, I'm done, you know, because he's the only one that can that can do it. He's the only one. And it's amazing because, I mean, God could have killed this guy, you know. Yeah, like, oh, man, you're worse than Solomon, you're worse than all these people, like, you know what, like, I'm just going to, you know, strike strike you dead or, you know, like, um, you know, all of these crazy stuff. He could have done it. I mean, but he listened to him. He listened to him. He had compassion on him, listened to him, and, and he found mercy. So it's not impossible, you know, or, or what I'm trying to say is that the way that I've seen that I saw repentance today was through idolatry. You know, that I can't say I repented if I'm still idolizing something or someone or whatever i can't say that i repented because repentance comes when you knock the idols down only when you knock the idols down hey man well that's gonna be hard to follow up on but uh, so far you know it's been a great message with repentance i think this is something that's very necessary for us to go back to basics with because as jackie said as gonzalo said um as everyone has said tonight it's something that we have to keep practicing over and over and over but I'm going to ask a question, um, and this is just to you. What is the reason that you repented? For example, what is the reason that you go to work? We don't go to work to make friends or to make the money company. I, I, in fact, we go to work to get our paycheck, right? You know, if they weren't paying you, you wouldn't be there, right? So the same thing with repentance. Why do we repent? Are we repenting to um, be a better person, to get a relationship with God? Well, all those that are, are true, but um, Paul gives a clear answer, uh, um, answer in the book of Acts, chapter 17, 28 through um, 31. And this is the purpose of repentance. And just to give some context, uh, right now Paul, the apostle, he's at um, Athens. He's in Greece. And for a lot of the Greeks in that time, they believed that everyone's going to end up in Hades. 
the land of the dead or the underworld. So the Greeks, they were living as, hey, it doesn't matter if you're good, Paul. Why are you doing that? We're all going to end up in the same place. And in the same uh, way, a lot of times we kind of think that, hey, we're all going to end up in the same place. Um, but Paul gives a clear answer on why the people, for, uh, why these uh, Greeks should repent. And he says this. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of our own poets have said, we are um, his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen um, from gold, silver, or stone, just as Gonzalo was saying. And this is like the purpose. Um, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, the Old Testament. But now he commands everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sins and to turn to him. And this is the reason right here. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed and proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. So that's about it. So the reason that we're repenting isn't, like I said, just to become a better person. Like, you know what? Once I was um, incarcerated, once I was a rapist, a murderer, a liar. No, the reason we repent is because there is a day of judgment. There's going to be a day where we all die and we're all going to be judged by the Lord. And on that day, that's where God's going to kind of expose you. If you get exposed right now, I don't know if you guys have ever been chewed out like by your parents or if pastor has ever said, hey, don't do that. And you kind of feel shame. Imagine that on the day you die, on that day of judgment. So he was telling the Greeks right here, you know, guys, there's going to be a day where you're going to have to pay for everything that you did. Everything that you've done, all those bad things are going to, you know, be exposed. And then he proved it to them by Jesus because in that time, you know, it was unheard of in the Greek time for someone to come back from the dead. And we know that Jesus Christ is going to be the one judging us through that. So anytime you guys think, you know, the reason I'm repenting, not only is it for myself or the church or for, you know, to make my mom, dad, uh, Gonzalo proud. It's to, um, so we could prepare ourselves for that day. So when we go on that day, as um, uh, what Edgar was reading, like, so we're clean. We're as white as wool. We're like, you know, as, like snow, we're pure. So that's the reason that we repent, guys. So keep that in mind every time, you know, with this message, as how's everything going on, you know. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord, everyone. Wow, this was an amazing uh, Bible study. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, repentance is uh, as simple as this. Uh, the scripture says that he came to seek that which was lost. So I remember one day I was looking for an address in California. And uh, in that time, uh, we didn't have the phones that we have now. If you uh, had any, t any source or any way of... Uh, uh, going uh, to find an address, you needed a GPS. Uh, but, the, you know, the old school ones, uh, and not many people had them, and I didn't have one. So when someone would call in, I would just get the address, and I'll ask more or less, where is it at? And then I would have to, you know, just go and see if I could find the address. And I remember just going around circles, different, like two or three times. And there was a person outside that was looking, you know, because there's always people in small uh, cities where when they see a car pass by once, they've never seen it before. Then again, and then again, it's kind of like right now us with the van that's outside, you know, something like that. It becomes suspicious. So uh, this woman, I guess, was one of those, you know, maybe neighborhood uh, watch or, you know, and she probably seen like, well, what is this guy doing? So I remember that she asked me, when I was going slow looking for the address, uh, she asked me, she, she said, young man, she said, are you lost? And, you know, Edgar said, you know, then pride kicked in, you know? Like, uh, I could have just told her, yes, I'm lost, you know, can you help me? But uh, I, I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. And then she was like, are you sure? It's because I seen you already, you know, I've been standing here and you pass. This is your third time. And then I, I looked at her and when she said that, something inside me told me, just tell her the truth, you know, you are lost, you know. And 
uh, and I was looking for an address that, that was one, those uh, type of houses that have two houses, one in the front and one in the back, you know, so I couldn't find the address, but it, 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 then I told her, I, 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 uh, more or less, I accepted that I was lost. I told her, okay, ma'am, I go, the true, I'm looking for this address. And then she said, oh, it's right here next to me, but the house in the back is like a duplex. And when she said that, I felt a sigh of relief. And then she just smiled. And she said, you seen how easy it was? And when she said that, you know, I, I just felt like, like I felt humbled, okay? I felt like a small little kid. You know, but uh, when she first asked me, I denied because I felt kind of like a shame, kind of like, uh, you know, you know, you don't know where you're at. You're lost. You know, an older person already feeling like he's lost. So with repentance, guys, you cannot repent if you don't acknowledge that you're a sinner. You, we cannot have an encounter with Christ if we don't acknowledge that we're lost without him. Uh, and in reality, uh, how do we know when someone has repented? It's very easy. When you have repented from for reals, for reals, guys, you can no longer have friendship with the world. You can't. You can no longer listen to woolly music and be okay with it. You can no longer sit in front of a TV for four, six hours. And be okay with it. Yesterday I had a, I had a, that hadn't happened to me in a while. I had some, uh, the Bohannons over at the house because they were getting their, their apartment, uh, you know, pest control. Uh, they had a lot of uh, roaches, you know, so they, they were working on the apartment. They had to leave for four hours. So we, you know, they came to the house. So I was there with them, you know, and we took them to the second living room and we were watching TV. We put the TV on for them. And my wife, she had to go. And my kids, they were upstairs. So I stayed with them down there. And we watched two movies. And I was just sitting there. You know, you hardly ever see me sitting in front of a TV. My kids know that. Uh, sometimes my wife has to beg me to watch a movie. You know, and, and uh, yesterday I had to watch two movies and I'm going to tell you that by the time the second movie was almost over I felt torture I, I felt I felt like like oh no this is horrible and I got up and I looked at them and I said hey guys the four hours are up I said do you guys want me to take you home now because I truly just wanted I wanted, I wanted to turn the TV off. And after that, they said, yeah, sure, you know, you can take us now. We turn, I turned off the TV quickly, and I said, okay, let's go, guys. And I took them to their apartment. When I was driving back, uh, guys, I was not feeling what I normally feel. I felt kind of spaced out. And when I walked into my house, I went upstairs, and I turned some you know, worship music on and everything so I can start feeling the presence of God again because the Holy Spirit, guys, gets saddened. And why am I saying this? Because if we're going to be completely honest, guys, sometimes I know there's people here that can spend easily four or five hours a day in social media, watching TV, playing video games, just right there and not feel anything. And I'm going to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, you can't do that no more. And when you have repented, for reals, for reals, from the bottom of your heart, you just can't do it. You just can't. And I'm not saying that when you repent, that you're perfect, and that all day, every day, you're just reading the Bible and praying and doing all this. No, it's, it's not like that. But your lifestyle and the things you do are always towards heaven, guys. Uh, the way you speak, the way you carry yourself, the places you go to, the things you watch, 
everything, everything goes aligned with the kind of, uh, the, you know, the, with the faith that we have and profess in Jesus Christ. We no longer have friendship with the world because we know what the scripture says in James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, you adulteress, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God or against God? You know, so therefore, if anyone wants to be a friend with the world, they constitute themselves or make themselves an enemy of God. Simple as that. See, uh, there is no communion between light and darkness. And a person that has repented, I'm not going to say they never make mistakes because, no, it's part of being human. It's a process. Yes, there will be mistakes. But the minute you make a mistake because you repented, the Holy Spirit sort of like rebukes you and you feel like, whoa, you know, this is not right. Uh, it's like that alarm, you know, that's always right there consistently. But when a person is not repented, guess what, guys? Is their lifestyle. They come to worship the Lord as a, somebody, I think, mentioned religion. You know, they do it in a sort of like, a, oh, well, yeah, I'm Christian. So, they, you know, I go to church because I'm Christian. You know, but only when they're here. But out there... You know, it's like whatever. When you repent it, you can't do that no more, guys. When you are truly repented, uh, here in church, we, we worship the Lord. When we're out there, we also continue being loyal and faithful to the Lord. Uh, not because we're, you know, we're around other people or, or pastor or, or, you know, those that uh, our brothers, in, you know, in Christ are seeing us. No, but because we acknowledge that God is always looking at us. The same eyes that see us here, guys, see us when you're, when you're out there in your house, when you go somewhere and with, with a friend or, or when you're with your uh, uh, friends, you know, that, that are worldly. The same eyes that see you here are out there seeing everything. So with that being said, guys, repentance literally is turning, turning from your old ways. Uh, we can describe it easily by 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if one is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things, what we used to be, whatever background we come from, because guys, all of us, all of us, there's not one person here that can say, I'm not a sinner. The scripture says, for all, all have sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But that, that's grace. That's why Jesus Christ came. And when we acknowledge that we all have different backgrounds, we all have different struggles, we're still a work in progress. But nevertheless, guys, when we have had an encounter with God's holiness, because that's, that's what repentance does. When you have an encounter with him, all of your sins are exposed because you can't hide anything from God. And that's why we cry. That's why he hurts us. When we have an encounter with Christ, everything that we've ever done, it's exposed and it's like put right before you. And it's like, like things that are so shameful, they're right here in front of you. And then God is right here just looking at you. And, and, and he, he's light. And everything that we did was nasty, dirty, darkness. And, and, and he's pure, and he's love, and he's so good, and all these things are evil, and, and they're so shameful even to talk about. And all, before, you, before you, you know it, like David said, you can't really put it in words. It's just a feeling that it just hurts that you have offended the one that created you, the one that loves us so much, the one that never did anything wrong, the one that took our sins on that cross. We deserve that cross, but he took it upon himself. And when we acknowledge that, that we were the ones that were, that were supposed to be on that cross, it hurts. And when that happens, guys, change follows. No one, no one, has an encounter with Jesus Christ and remains the same. No one. There's a change. Some are uh, one day to the other. Others, it's a, it's a process. Others take a little longer than, you know, than others. It, we're all in that process. So I want to believe that all of us here, we're in that process. All of us here, guys. So let's just continue moving forward as a family Helping one another. Uh, you know, uh, 
not judging one another, not looking down on one another, because truth be told, we all have something that we need to work on. There's, I mean, I can, I can say, I say it for myself. I have things that uh, God is still dealing with me. I have things that I wish I can do better. And I know all of us, we can all say, you know what, I do got things that I could do better myself. So let's just be with that mindset, guys. Humbleness is a key to repentance. It takes humbleness, guys. So let's do a prayer now. With that, we're going to be dismissed. And in this prayer, see this teaching right here that was brought tonight, it's just to bring awareness, guys. Awareness because I truly believe that sometimes um, when we haven't understood this topic tonight, uh, we may think, uh, like Sister Patty was saying on Wednesday for those that were here, when you see death real close, all of a sudden, you know, when you know about God and you're in the things of God, immediately you kind of like examine yourself. Because you know you're going to have to give an account to God. And when you're honest, you realize where you are still at fault. Where, which areas in your life you still have to change. So, with that being said, guys, this teaching, I truly believe, that awakens that in each one of us. Let's just be honest with ourselves. No, no one is judging us, but we be our own judge. You know, because the scripture says that no one knows what's in a man, but the spirit of the man. Okay, and God, who knows all things. That's why this teaching was brought, guys. So we more or less can examine ourselves and look at our life, the way we're living right now. And ask yourself, if I was to die tonight, am I truly prepared to meet my creator? Because that's a fact, guys. We're all going to die one day. I'm not saying tonight, but, you know, that's a fact. One day, all of us. So when we get a teaching like this, I, I truly believe that it speaks to our conscience. This is a message that should awaken our conscience. And, 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 and us look at ourselves before God. How am I? before the Lord. Do I truly know what repentance is? Because I'm going to tell you something. Without repentance, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, if you are not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that's what repentance is. Born again. Born again. Amen. Let's pray right now and just examine yourselves and then just say, Lord, I need to work on this. Thank you for this teaching tonight. Now I know what I need to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to be here in your house of prayer. Jesus, we come before you, Lord, and we acknowledge you, Lord, as our Lord and our Savior. Jesus, you know all things. We, the scripture says that we haven't even spoken, and you already know the word that we're going to speak. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our minds, our thoughts. You know all things. Jesus, I ask, Lord, that you give us the strength, hallelujah, to change those things, those areas in our lives, Lord, that still need to be transformed and changed. Something that we are still struggling with, Lord, we ask that you help us, Lord, because we can't do it without you, Lord. But tonight, Lord, we're laying it all in your hand, Lord. We don't want to continue, Lord, struggling with the same things we've been struggling, Lord. We are surrendering those things, Lord. That we know are not right before your sight. Jesus, your word was spoken here in this place, Lord. And your word never, ever returns to you empty-handed. Lord, I ask that you enlighten each one of us, Lord, in those areas that need to be enlightened. Awaken our spirits, Lord, within us, Lord. Jesus, give us the peace in our hearts, Lord. And give us the strength, Lord. And break anything, Lord, that is holding us from being all we can be for you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you take each one of my brothers and my sisters home safely, Lord. And that this word continue ministering into our hearts. Bless each one of those youth that are here, Lord. Young ladies, young men, juniors, Lord, that made it here tonight. Bless each one of them, Lord. Bless them in their homes, Lord. And that this word continues ministering into their hearts. And bless 
your servant, Edgar, Lord, for this teaching that he brought, hallelujah, tonight with your help, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We are dismissed.